I want to play a little game. It's called what is the same about these line array deployments? Here we go. Going to be two sets of two pictures. Here's the first and the second, the third and the fourth. I got these from a, a Discord server. I'm on the Signal to Noise podcast. So I appreciate those who have posted pictures. Okay, let's check it out. You probably guessed it. They're straight. So all straight, all straight. This is seven or eight boxes over half of the array is straight. Then it curves at the bottom, a cute little J array. And then this is all straight. You may be asking, well, it is a line array. So what's so bad about the boxes being a straight line? How come you're picking on them, Michael? If you are unaware, a line array on the back of it, you have variable curvature. And how it does that is this little pin on the back can adjust display angles between the adjacent boxes. So looking at this in software, this is the JBR, JBL SRX906, and each speaker in between each box, I'm able to choose that display angle. So by having this at two degrees, it is two degrees of separation between this box and this box. And here at the bottom it is 12 degrees. So you can see even here at the back, it's butted all the way against its neighbor for a maximum amount of separation in the splay. Okay. So before we pick on straight lines, we need to ask ourselves, how are point sources and line arrays different? And that will give us some of the underlying concepts for us to be able to make good decisions about how to deploy line arrays, AKA not in a straight line. A quick refresher on point sources, they're good at steering high frequency energy and high frequency meaning they have small wavelengths, the what, how far they travel in a single cycle to complete their cycle. And they have waveguides. So a waveguide is the actual physical part of the speaker that can steer the energy where we want it. Where waveguides start becoming effective is where they're equal wavelength with their drivers. So this is a K12. It is a uh, 12 inch speaker right here, and that's a foot. The frequency is about one foot is one K. And a good rule of thumb is whatever wavelength is equal to its driver size, you're gonna get about 90 degrees of coverage and it'll get narrower from there, the higher you go in frequency. So that's here at this, this guy right here. But this K12, it's actually a 75 degree speaker. So here on the high frequency driver, it's able to steer energy physically with how it's designed within that coverage pattern, which that means they're not very good at steering low frequency energy. And why is that? Long wavelengths are hard to control. We cannot do that physically without other means. And we'll get to that in a little bit. And point sources, again, they're useful, they're great, they've done audio for forever, but they have an inflexible vertical coverage shape, meaning where I put them, I can't change it after I have a 75 by 75 degree box, a 90 by 60 box, 110 by 50 box. I'm kind of stuck with what I got. And as a good rule of thumb, I don't want to put it in a position where it's trying to cover an audience with a range ratio larger than the absolute max four to one, um, all the way down to two to one. And meaning, if I have an audience and my speaker is up right here, I don't want the ratio from it throwing to the back row versus the front row to be greater than four to one. As an absolute max, I feel much better if it's three to one or less, okay? And that's because at point source, we cannot change its vertical coverage behavior and it's on axis throw is gonna be the strongest and it'll taper off towards the edge, which actually plays into our advantage as we're going to the front row, all right? So what does this look like in action? This is a 50 degree vertical coverage box, a Meyer X40 in MAP XT, throwing it back with this software. Uh, there's now MAP 3D, but I like XT for doing these type of diagrams. And this is 4K. 4K is right in the middle of the high frequencies and is a good proxy for high frequency coverage, but is not the end all be all. So this is what a 50 degree uh, vertical coverage box looks like. And then 110, as you see, it moves much wider. But as we move to low frequencies, again, they're much, much harder to steer because they're big and long. So why I have this school bus right here is that's how long a 31 hertz wave is. It's about 36 feet or 11 meters, uh, maybe 12 meters, something like that. And that's the low B on a five string. And we want our systems to be able to get all the way down there to accurately reproduce it. When you get really low, for sure, things are moving much like in this true point source. This is where we get a point source speaker because it's sound emanating from one point. 
And right here is what's called the wave front. So that's moving out. And this is illustrating the inverse square law where we actually get a quarter of sound intensity as we're moving out, uh, doubling the distance, right? Um, so if I compare these two, 250 Hertz is moving out pretty much in all directions from the speaker. It has a little bit more of a forward energy than rearward, but it has much control at 4K. Again, this is not Meyer's fault for making a bad speaker. This is something about all point source speakers that we need to be aware of. So if I actually put it in a situation where we want to cover something, I've got this single guy way up in the air. He's now throwing to the back and then to the front right here. And we're a little bit over a three to one range ratio. So this is how we're doing at 4K. So if I look at the color changes, this is 3 dB per color change. So this is that blue. And sorry, we're gonna move right here. And then right here, it says 9 dB of difference front to back. Not the end of the world, but I think we can make it better. And this is what it looks like at 250 Hertz. Again, a much different coverage shape. If I had a stage over here, uh, that would be getting a lot more 250 Hertz than this speaker over here. That's why most feedback, unless we're in the speaker's coverage, is low frequency because that's what's bleeding onto stage, right? So this is a 50 degree point source at 250 Hertz that is by far a lot wider than 50 degrees. Now, let's finally get on to our line array. So this is a fairly proper deployment of a line array. It's up in the air and I've got it spread so where it covers the audience. I have a little bit of overshoot and you'll see this in later designs. Uh, this is beyond today's scope, why I have overshoot and a little bit beyond. Uh, but it's not just simply point and shoot with the line array. We have to look about the interaction between the boxes. I'll cover that in a future video, uh, but we're not gonna worry about it today. So this is now comparing a point source at the exact same position at 4K, and then a proper line array deployment at 4K. And we can see here, we have much less energy change front to back, and it does a better job keeping it consistent with vertical coverage. So that's what I want to highlight. We have invariable or unchangeable vertical coverage once we have the set box uh, speaker coverage specs. But with the line array, we can change the coverage shape depending on our splay angles. So now let's look at, at 250 hertz. Same thing, we have it mostly radiating uh, in a circle at 250 hertz on a point source, having point source behavior, we get something really cool here at 250 is that it takes on a much narrower shape. It's not perfect. We can do some things to actually steer that energy a little bit within the array. But I just want to illustrate that even low frequencies, depending on how long your line array is, can get steered as well. One of their main uh, selling points when you have a high range ratio um, of what's going on front to back. So we're able to focus energy. So why the focusing? That's the million dollar question right here. And can we have too much of a good thing? Hint, hint. And that's because we have overlap in the array. So we have overlap in the low frequency elements because it's ballooning out, but because of their distance offsets and how they're arriving at the center, we get that focusing. Again, I'll dive into more of that in a, in a later video, but today I wanna focus on the high frequency overlap in the array. So let's double down on that. So remember, we can adjust the overlap in the line array with these display angles on the back. So let's take a look at a few different case studies and ways we could spread out this high frequency energy. So we're moving here. This is the same 10 box array. And I put every single box at its maximum splay of 11 degrees. And this is what the coverage shape looks like. So we see each individual element kind of doing its own thing and they're not combining very much and filling in these holes because they are at maximum splay. Uh, and this is some of the trade-off we're having with the line array and that each element from a vertical coverage perspective is what's called proportional beam width, that the higher we go in frequency, the more narrow that beam gets. And so boxes uh, or line arrays actually start to sound worse, in my opinion, the, uh, the, when you're getting to its most splayed part because they are, you're having to compromise a little bit and how they're interacting with each other. That's neither here nor there. But I always feel if I'm in a mixed position, I'm going to be listening to a show. I want to be at mid distance, even three, three quarter distance versus the front of the line array because that's where I feel like line arrays are most variable in their high frequency spectrum. 
All right, so we looked at everything at maximum splay. And now here is I started the first box from the first to the second at a one degree splay, and then went two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven with 12 boxes in the array. And we can see here the top of the array has a lot of overlap, so it's going to couple or combine together and throw far. And if we move down to the lower part of the array, we don't have near as much because they're spread out so that energy doesn't go as far. So when you're asking how far can this line array throw, yes, it's up to the total SPL capabilities of the rig, but a lot of it's going to be up to the design how much we're asking the elements to couple together. Now armed with this knowledge, let's now analyze what it looks like to have every box at zero degrees or similar to what we have here on the right. And we see this 4K spike of death. And why is that? It's because every single box has no chance to have separation. We are in a 100% overlap with everything in the array and then half of the coverage within the top uh, parts of the boxes. So during in the center is where they're gonna couple the most because that's where most of the boxes are all meeting each other and it gets this long skinny spike of death. So if the average ear height is right here in this array and I have a basketball player listening in my audience who's really tall and then a child, they're all gonna be at different ear heights, but that person might be right here, right here, and right here, obviously scaled to size, and get very different experiences in what the high frequencies are gonna look like. So let's look at 250 Hertz. Similar narrowing of the pattern, um, and I'm not putting this in an audience context yet, but I just want you to see that even having them in a straight line like that is going to narrow the low mids as well, and that's ultimately up to the total line length, which I'll cover again in a later video. So let's look at this in context. So let's now extend my audience to be on the floor, and let's say we have bleachers extending up high. So this is what I think they were trying to do is have all these boxes here at the top that are all coupled together, they're all at zero, and then we have this J at the bottom that's getting down here to the front. And we can see now there's a giant gap in the high frequencies here at the rear of the floor because we're having all this energy concentrated and doing this beam of death up here to the, the bleachers up here and then some energy here, but we have a big hole. But we're actually doing okay at 250 Hertz with this design. It's not perfect, but there's a much less of a variance. We have this, this lobe here that's missing right here uh, but all of this was within the same color and we are okay. So we have, again, have a very different experience of tonal uniformity throughout our audience. So the high frequencies are making this shape, the low frequencies are making this shape. Again, it's our job as system engineers to have as much of the spectrum be at the same level and tonal uniformity in every single seat. As you see, this is not doing that. So let's drill down a little bit more with the data and I've actually placed three microphones here at the top, the rear of the floor and the front of the floor. And right here at 500 Hertz is where we start to diverge. And we see this drop off in high frequency energy here at the rear floor and things actually stay flat uh, on through about 10K in the upper bleacher. So we can see it's a very different experience, more than a 10 dB delta between someone on the floor at the rear versus up in the bleachers. Um, and that's not even considering the, the low mid difference as well. So what if we've tried a different approach? You're like, okay, Michael, don't put your boxes at zero. What should we do? There are lots of different ways to go about line array design. Uh, a lot to learn from Bob McCarthy and Merlin Van Veen, and they're, they're very valuable. This is, why I think is probably the most simplest place to start uh, from a visual perspective if you want to get something in the ballpark. What I want you to do is probably have one or two boxes of overshoot, and I'll cover that in a later video as to why. And what I've done here with these red arrows is they're all of equal size. And I've just spread it out to where I've tried to get the impact lines, and these are these yellow lines, these impact points that are coming and hitting the ground all within equal spacing. And why is that? If every box where it lands on the audience has equal spacing, in theory, that should be equal distribution of energy. Again, why this is why uh, line arrays are really cool, that we could change their coverage shape with splay angles to make it fit to our audience size. Whereas with the point source, we're stuck. There's definitely a time and place for point sources, 
but where we have to bend and make our coverage shape change to fit an audience, uh, this is a really highly valuable thing to have. So this is a design that I came up with this space. It's not perfect, and this is just 4K, but this is everything at equal impact points. It probably could fine tune it some more, but let's contrast this at 4K versus this. See, I'm, it's doing a much better job of making sure energy is getting down here. And let's take a look at the measurements. So this is comparing the J splay design to equal impact. And we can see that these traces are aligning much more closely, especially from 250 Hertz all the way on up to 4K. And then we have a little bit or actually a lot of it, a variance here at the front. And he, what's the, here's the cool thing. We can actually do two different things. We can actually do low mid beam steering, which is in Meyer sounds case is applying all pass filters to actually tilt up the array in the low mids. And we can apply EQ on a per box zone to shade down the high frequency to give it even more equal. So let's take a look at that. So after a little bit of processing, I was able to get the response even closer. I know down here, I can't really do a whole lot about that blue trace of making it uh, even closer because that's really just up to the array's length and its positioning to the audience. But I mean, come on, from like 250 all the way here, things are tracking really closely and I am happy with that. So again, it's my goal and hopefully your goal as the A1 or systems engineer on the shows that you're responsible for to get it sounding as even and tonally uh, coherent or consistent uh, throughout the entire audience. And we can use line arrays to bend them to the shape that we want. Whereas if we put boxes at zero, we're focusing too much energy at one single point, gonna make this spiky, hollow, pokey sound that isn't very good, at least in my opinion. So let's recap here. Line array, array element overlap creates energy addition. And the lower frequency we go, the less control we have over the overlap, but the splay angles, we have the most amount of control and the high frequencies more or less from 1K and up. By having more overlap in the line array, we get more addition and it throws farther with those elements. If we spread them out, it spreads out the energy, it does not throw as far. Number two, we can vary splay angles to shape coverage to match your audience. So by choosing uh, to have the lines of the, the impact points spaced evenly is a good approximation of how the energy is gonna distribute in your audience. Number three, zero degree splays create high frequency spikes. So it's too much concentration in one spot, doesn't sound good. So make sure to have at least one degree splay between, between each box. You can go all the way down to 0.5 or even 0.25 in some companies' cases which there's some debate about whether that actually gets crushed down due to rigging slot. Another topic for another time, but excited to have been covering this with you today. Bottom line, don't use zero degrees, space your boxes evenly, and I think you'll have much uh, better sounding shows versus having them all compacted together, creating these high fre frequency spikes of death. My name is Michael Curtis. We'd love to hear your thoughts below. Uh, have you had any other strategies that have been helpful to you in deploying your line arrays? Please let me know. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I'll catch you next time.